Hello, everybody. Uh, there's this famous interview question that says, uh, you type python.org into the web browser and press enter. What happens? And this talk is a bit similar. It's about what happens when you try to import some random module. Whew, lots of stuff happens. Uh, a little bit after I submitted the talk, I learned that David Beasley did a three-hour tutorial on this on, the, on this year's PyCon. So I'll try to look at it from a different angle, but the, if this talk is not enough for you, then there's lots, lots more material you can, you can use to learn. Uh, more than a deep dive, it'll be like a guided tour through what happens when you import something. But hopefully when we're finished with the talk, you can take deep dives through the source code yourself. So what happens when you uh, execute this command? Uh, under the covers, there's a global dunder import function that gets called, and the result from that is assigned to a variable. That's pretty much all that happens. Now, the import statement is a little more, more powerful than that. It kind of evolved over the years, so you can uh, do sub-package imports with these dots. You can import stuff uh, from modules, and the mapping from this to the dunder import function is not always trivial, uh, but it's uh, it's uh, documented pretty well in the docs, so if you want to do that, then write, uh, then read it. Uh, but all the Dunder import function is is an interface to the import machinery, which nowadays is uh, all written in Python. It's uh, in the import lib module. So uh, if you don't want to do this when you import something programmatically, there's also a convenience function called import module that's uh, much better to use. So if you have a string with a module name, just use that. It's also just an interface to the import machinery. Uh, the other thing you can do with Dunder import is replace it with your own function, but that is not very useful because then you have to re-implement most of the machinery yourself. So you're not, it's not useful to call Dunder import, it's not useful to uh, replace it, so it's probably better if you just forget about it. The import statement calls the import machinery. Uh, and I will talk about what the import machinery does. Uh, I'll skip all the locking and caching, error handling, and older pythons, all the stuff that takes most of the library, uh, but it's not really necessary for you to know what, what's going on. So the basic algorithm for what happens when you import something is actually pretty simple. Looks like this. The first thing you get is this cache. There's this sys.modules dictionary. So if you import a module that already has been imported, it's stored in the cache. So when you re-import a module, you get exactly the same object back. There's a catch to this. Uh, when you delete something from the dictionary and then re-import the same module, it's uh, gone from the sys modules, so the import machinery thinks it's never been imported, and it imports the module again. You get a brand new module object, and every function and every class in there will be brand new, which most of the time is not something you want because stuff doesn't expect this. But you can do this. The other thing you can do is poison the cache. You can just assign anything to sys modules. Uh, so you can put a string in there, but then when you then import it, you get a string as a module and you can use all the string operations on it. And some modules actually use this to uh, make modules that are callable or subscriptable or have arbitrary attributes. So there's some limited use to this, but uh, Maybe you shouldn't do it in production. So that's the first statement. The second, there's this find spec function that takes the name of the module and the path. In most cases, the path will be sys.path, which is just a list of all locations that uh, modules can be imported from on my system. It's usually much longer than this. For uh, details on how it's constructed, see David Beasley's talk. He, uh, talks about it at length. So with these two, uh, I call the find spec, and that gives me a spec object, the module spec object. 
And that is just a description of how the module will be loaded and where it will be loaded from. You, uh, there's actually a utility function that you can call to get the spec without importing the module, like this. So the module spec gives you the name, uh, the loader, which is kind of the strategy, how it'll be loaded, and the origin, which is where the module will be loaded from. And so you can do that without importing the object, which might be useful at some times. Also, the module spec uh, becomes a permanent record of how the module was loaded. So you can, with any module, you can look at the Dunder spec attribute and see where, it's, where it got loaded from. Uh, the next step is at the actual loading. Now, uh, we'll look at it in a little bit more detail later, but what happens here is an empty module object is put into his modules, and after that, it's initialized. It's important that it's done in the, this exact order. First, it's put into his modules, and after that, it's initialized and all the functions and classes get assigned to it. And after that, uh, the machine error looks into his modules and returns whatever it found there. And this is a simplification, of course, but you can already use it to solve real-world problems. For example, uh, import cycles, everybody's favorite thing when it comes to importing, as I've learned. So we have two modules here, and one imports the other, and the other imports the first one again. This is a very bad thing to do. Uh, but, uh, and yeah, it, it usually results in errors that are not so nice. But if you know this algorithm, you can reason your way through what is happening. So if I import foo, uh, it checks this module, doesn't find foo there, so it finds the source code for foo and starts loading it, it starts going through it. Uh, well, first it puts it in sys modules and then it starts going through the source one line by line. The first thing it finds is import bar, so it goes to import bar, doesn't find it in sys modules, so it puts an empty module object in sys modules and uh, starts going through that. The first thing it finds is another import, so it uh, tries to import foo, uh, looks in sys modules and it finds foo in there because it already put it there, but it's not gone through all the initialization yet. So we get a half initialized foo object here. And then we try to uh, call this function, which Python didn't see yet in this initialization. So this falls with an attribute error. And the whole thing bails out, you get an import error and you start looking where uh, the error is, it's not so obvious. Uh, there are some tools that can detect these import cycles and, and warn you, which you should use. And uh, uh, the best way to, to solve this problem is probably to take the functions that both modules need and move them to a different module, import that. But if you ever run into this situation, you already know how to solve it. Okay, so here we go. You can see I left some space here because there's obviously something more. And the something more has to do with submodules and packages. So let's go, go through a little bit of vocabulary. Uh, our random module was a top-level module. You can import it directly. So is urllib, for example. But urllib also has some other module be below it. So urllib is a package. It's a parent of urllib parse and urllib request and urllib response. And those are submodules of this urllib. Everybody clear on that? I hope you knew that already. So what happens when I try to import a submodule well, is first, the path is different. For submodules, the path is not in this path, but the path is taken from the parent. So the parent has this path attribute, and that says where all the submodules are loaded from. And the second thing as, that's different is these two parts. So for submodules, the parent is always loaded first. There's no way to load urllib parse without loading urllib. It's, it's always done first. And if loading the parent somehow causes urllib parse to also be loaded, at this point it's just return, otherwise it's imported normally. 
And at the end, after everything's done, uh, the submodule is set as an attribute on the parent. So if you import urllib.parse, the object you actually get is urllib, but it has an attribute parse on it that you can get by the dot because it's set as the attribute at the very end of importing. So uh, there's the more complete algorithm, which you can use to solve uh, or reason about more complex uh, situations that involve uh, submodule loading. So for example, if I have this simple package in a .py with two imports, uh, some constant value and some code that uses it, and I try to import that, so what happens? Uh, the parent module is always loaded first, no matter which one of these you import. So first it looks and says modules for foo doesn't find that. Goes to find, it goes to uh, look up the source and execute it by li line by line. So here we go, goes to the import function, uh, import statement, which uh, invokes the machinery again. Uh, looks and says dot modules for foo dot main. Doesn't find that. Because it's a, a, a submodule, it goes to load foo, which was already loaded. It's already in modules, so it returns early. And it goes to uh, executing the code. It gets, gets to this import statement, and it tries to import foo again. Looks in modules, some module is there, so it returns that. And then we try to use it. At which point we use the foo module, but it doesn't have the const attribute yet because that gets initialized at the end of this import that we didn't get to yet. So once again, you get an error. And this is kind of complex, and you have to understand this, this algorithm, which arguably is not that hard, but if you have bigger modules, then it gets a bit complicated. So I've prepared a set of little rules that you should follow to be okay. First of all, your init should be kind of a public interface to your package. So it should just import stuff from submodules, maybe set under all, and do nothing else. And then your submodules should not use the public interface. They should import directly from the submodules they want, because you uh, probably know about the internal structure of your package. And obviously, you shouldn't have import cycles in the modules, in the submodules themselves. So if you follow these rules, you should be OK. Otherwise, understand this algorithm, and you can reason your way through. Hey, uh, so that's for this. And maybe you're wondering what exactly this find spec does. So let's look at that. Let's look at first the result. Where do you actually load a module from? So if I import my random module, I can print it out, and I see it's loaded from some location on my system. I can look at the under file attribute and get the same thing back as string. But if I import another module, say sys, print it out, and I see it's built in, I see it doesn't have it under file attribute. Does anybody know where the sys module is actually located on your system? No, sys is actually built into the executable itself. So in my case, it's under user bin Python 3. It's built into the actual program. Uh, yeah, but all the other modules are, are in this place. So these are two different types of modules. Uh, if we have a look at the aquarium of module types we can see, we have the built-in modules, which are written in C and compiled into Python itself. We have some source modules, which are written in Python and loaded from files. And we have some other types of modules as well. We can have extension modules, which are written in C or some other compiled language and loaded from a file or a shared library. On my system, that's math. Uh, for example, some NumPy core modules uh, can be extension modules as well. And the fourth type is frozen modules, which are written in Python and compiled into the executable itself. Uh, one example that everybody uses is frozen import lib, which is a copy of the import machinery 
that's uh, built into Python for loading the real import machinery because you have to use the import machinery to read stuff from files. And stuff like uh, app, uh, stuff like uh, Py2App or Py2Exa uh, actually compile Python modules into the resulting executable to make one file executable. So that's a use case for that. So how do we load all these different kinds of modules? Well, there's this list of strategies to use in sys.metapath, and the algorithm is quite simple. Uh, we just ask each of these finders in turn if they can load our module. So if I'm loading the sys module, I ask the built-in importer, hey, do you have a sys module? And the built-in importer looks at the list of built-in modules and it says, yep, here it is, here's the information, and gives me a spec for it. If, I, if I'm importing random, I, look, I ask the built-in importer, and it doesn't find a random module in built-in modules, so I ask the frozen importer, it doesn't find random in the list of frozen modules, so I ask the pathfinder. And the pathfinder is a bit more complicated. This is the thing that looks at sys.path. And it goes through every entry in syspath in order, and for every path, it, uh, it has what is called a path hook. The algorithm looks, looks like this. Uh, so it'll go to the uh, current directory and construct a path hook for that. So zip importer can't handle directories, so it's skipped. But there's a file finder which can handle directories. So that one is used for the current directory. And there we look for uh, these files. And we probably don't find any of those there. So we'll go to the next entry, which is a zip file. We ask a zip importer for this zip file. If it can find any of these, it can't. Uh, so we go to the next entry uh, and ask the file finder if it can find any of these in there. And it can. It's there. Uh, Random.py is actually in this directory. And since the file is there, the, the spec is returned. Now, at this point, we have a spec. And when we actually have a spec, we don't look any further. So when the file exists, it's, uh, the spec is returned for it, and the machinery doesn't look any, any further uh, in the path. So the first match wins. And what's in the module spec? Again, we have the name. We have the origin, which is the source code to load. We have a location for the cache file, which may or may not exist. We have the loader, which is the strategy to use to load the source, and some other uh, loader-specific information. Uh, you can read all about this in the pep that I will link later. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's how you get the spec. And we have a bit more time left, so I can talk about how to actually load a module. So once we have the spec, the loading is Kind of simple. First, we create a module object. And a module object is nothing special. It's just an object that has a name attribute, a uh, dunder name. Uh, either the loader, loader can create one, or if it uh, doesn't want to, then we create a default one. After that, we set the initial module attributes, uh, which are actually just copied from the spec. So the spec gets copied to dunder spec, the name gets copied to dunder name. So now we have two places for each of these bits of information, which is kind of redundant, and you can change each one of these individually, so it's a bit of a mess. Uh, but one of these is always used later. Uh, and after that, uh, we put the module in sys.modules and execute whatever source code we find. Uh, the global variables, uh, variables, uh, are actually just uh, attributes on the module objects, which is kind of fun to play with. If you import the main uh, module, you can uh, assign a global variable, get it back as an attribute, or vice versa. Uh, this, is, uh, this is also where Dunder name comes from. It's assigned uh, very early in the loading phase. So by the time you get to executing your code, it's already there, you can check what it is. So 
yeah, that's, that's executing the module. And one more thing I have, uh, oh, uh, one more thing I have is how to actually get the so, this code for a source module. Uh, so in the module spec, we have both the origin, the, the PY file, and the cache location. And if the cache location exists and uh, it was compiled from a matching PY file, it has the same size and same modification time, then bytecode is uh, read from the cache file and execute and you know, returned and executed. If it doesn't match, then it's read from the, the origin file and potentially stored in the cache. Uh, if you're familiar with how Python 2 did this, uh, the origin and cache were in the same directory, which had the problem that if you deleted, can you see that? I guess you can. Uh, if you deleted the py file, then the pyc got executed. So it was this zombie that for some reason was there and did the same thing as a deleted <coughs> file, which used to throw off a lot of beginners and not only them. In Python 3, we have the PyCache directory, which no longer has this problem. So in the PyCache, we have the PIC, but if the PY is not there, uh, the cache isn't even looked at. What you can do if you really want to load things from PYCs is copy the PYC over to the old location and delete the PY, and it'll <coughs> actually work. And this is all the code. It's just a screenful of what you have to understand. And if you want any more details, the import lib is installed on your computer, so you can just look at it now and see what's going on. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Do we have any questions? Thank you for your talk. Uh, I would like to know if what was the use case on being able to load um, source code from a zip file? Because excuse me, uh, is, where is the use case on uh, loading code on zip files? Um, from PYC files? No, no, zip. Oh, C files. Zip, zip files. Zip, yeah. Okay. Uh, when I when I showed you the different kinds of modules, I wasn't really complete. It's, it looks like this. So you can lo uh, load from native code, for example, written in C. You can load from Python code or bytecode. Uh, you have built-in frozen extension source and sourceless. Sourceless are the PYCs. And you can also uh, load source or sourceless files from zips. And this is done uh, for uh, uh, to ease packaging, for example, some Windows users don't like deep directory structures where you have lots of files in, in directories. So you just zip them, those all up into, uh, into a, nowadays it, it usually has the PYZ extension and you can import directly from that. You can, if you, uh, you can actually run those. The PYZ is assigned to, to Python and if you have a Dunder main module in there, it'll actually run it. Also on Linux, if it has the shebang, it, it can run those. So it's just a, an easier, to way, easier way to package things. You just download one zip file and everything's in there. Any more questions? If there are no questions, I can find something else to talk about. <laughs> Do we have time? A few minutes. All right, so one thing I forgot is this create module and exec module. So uh, this is for Python modules. For C modules, like, uh, like the extension or built-in ones, everything happens in create module. There's a py init uh, hook function that creates the module and also initializes it at one step. And then this exec is just a no-op, does nothing. Uh, so that was that is the current situation with Python 
for Python 3.5, there is new a new mechanism that uh, uh, does something similar to the Python modules. So the create uh, creates an empty object, and then there's a separate exec and that you can uh, do your work in, which is better because at the time exec uh, is run, the module object is already in sys modules. For example, what could happen before is if you ran some user code, ran some Python code, and it tried to import your module again, you would get into an infinite loop because it's not in the cache. So it would try to re-import uh, your module again. And there's, uh, the, mod the loading is a bit more declarative now. It's in pep uh, 489, and you can go read that if you're interested. Uh, yeah, so there's work going on in, in this area still, and uh, I hope the talk won't be obsolete in a few years. Question here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what would happen if you loaded a module with a class in it. Uh, once again? Uh, you, lo you load a module. Um, it's got a class in it. Right. You instantiate that class. Mm -hmm. And then you do that trick that you said you shouldn't do at the start, where you reinitialize that module, you reload yes. it. Yes. So, uh, so what the reinitialization or just reload does is it uh, creates creates a new module object, creates new class objects. But every instance of an existing class has a reference to the original class. So all the old instances would use the old class, and all the new instances would use the new class, uh, which uh, creates some problems. For example, if you try, if uh, you use, uh, uh, you try to check for equality and it's implemented by looking at the class, then the classes obviously don't match and you have a problem because you think they're the same and the represent, string representation is the same, but the class is actually different, and who looks at the class ID, right? Uh, so there are some use cases for this, but it's usually better to stay well away from it. Okay, thanks very much, Peter. Thank you.